Great. Welcome, everyone. Great to be with you. Uh, my name is Joe Warchunas. I'm with Electrify Now. I'm here with my teammate, Brian, from Electrify Now. Uh, we'll introduce our panelists in just a second, uh, Nate Adams and Sean Armstrong. Welcome to this webinar that we are really excited about, how to electrify your home. Really important topic today. Um, just a little background on Electrify Now. We uh, we are a nonprofit volunteer organization trying to spread the word about electrification. We boil our message into four key points. One, clean up your electric supply, buy renewable energy, uh, put solar panels on your roof. Two, electrify your home, uh, make an electrification plan. Three, electrify your transportation, be it a bike or a car. And then four, electrify everyone. We'll talk to you about the program to how to expand electrification to as many people as possible. In just a second. Uh, we want to say thank you as always to our Electrify Coalition members. These are over 30 nonprofits and for profits that believe in electrification and support uh, this work. Um, so thank you to our members. If you're interested in becoming a member, uh, it's no cost. Um, just email Brian or I will put our emails in the chat room. And of course, thank you to all of our donors for Electrify Everyone. You probably know this if you've been to our webinars. We put a quick plug in uh, at every webinar and you see it as you're signing up for the Eventbrite. Our Electrify Everyone program is where we take out old inefficient gas hot water heaters uh, and we, uh, with our partners Community Energy Project, install new heat pump water heaters. Uh, to date, we've raised over $2,600 through our webinars alone. That's enough for two uh, electric water heaters. The program is installed over 35 and we have enough funds for at least uh, 50 more. Is that right, Brian? Yep. Yeah. So we're, we're super excited about this program. Thank you for your generosity. We'll put another link in the chat room, but thanks to all those for uh, donating to the Electrify Everyone program. Uh, of course, don't miss our upcoming webinars. We do our, our monthly webinars next month. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to get rid of uh, gas powered uh, lawn tools with the all electric yard care uh, webinar. That's going to be really uh, exciting and great. And then of course in July, we're gonna be talking about ductless heat pumps uh, and how efficient they are and what uh, cases they work in. Maybe we'll talk about them a little bit today as well. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about uh, resilience in, in uh, August. Of course, some of us have heard about uh, the, the folks in Texas or in California uh, losing power. How do we have an all electrified future and uh, remain resilient at the same time? So join us for these upcoming webinars. Uh, you can go to our website, electrifynow.net and also check us out on YouTube, just Google Electrify Now uh, YouTube to see all of our previous webinars. Great, so uh, we just wanted to set the stage for what questions our fantastic uh, world-renowned experts of today are going to be answering. Um, uh, so uh, some of the questions are, why should I electrify our, my home? A big uh, initial question. How do I get started? Are electric heat pumps better than gas furnaces? Uh, do heat pumps work in cold climates? Our guest Nate will be able to answer that from Cleveland. Uh, will, will heat pumps work in old houses? Uh, again, Nate in Cleveland will help with that. Uh, do I have enough room in my electrical panel uh, to electrify my house? Um, how do I know if I'm getting a good heat pump? And uh, what are some other technologies that I should be considering? So uh, to set the stage for why we're talking about this, I'll pass it over to Brian. Um, yeah, and also just want to remind people, you know, these are some of the big obvious questions, but I'm sure a lot of you have your own questions. And so be sure to put those in the chat. Um, we'll be monitoring that through throughout the program. And if we can't answer it right away, we'll make sure we uh, we bring that to the attention of our uh, panelists at the end of the session when we have some time for Q&A. So give us your zingers because these if these guys can't answer them, nobody can. All right, so I'm just gonna give a little, before we turn it over to our amazing panelists, I wanna um, just give a little bit of a, hey, why are we even talking about this in the first place? And then with uh, Nate and Sean, we'll be talking more about how you do it. But a lot of people, you know, still maybe not understand why electrification is so important. And I just wanna talk about things at a kind of a high level. The, the first thing to, for people to know is that most of our, carbon emissions as regular people here in, in the United States or pretty much anywhere in the world comes from the energy that we consume. And, and in the United States, about 60% of uh, an individual's 
uh, responsibility in terms of the emissions that, that we, we kind of own, so to speak, come from the energy we consume. So think about it as your electric bill, your the gas you put in your car, your natural gas bill and the, the natural gas you consume if you, if you have that in your home. So 60% of your emissions are from, think of it as the energy you pay for, okay? And then there's a lot of energy in the other stuff, the, stu the stuff that we buy, the products we buy. Of course, most of the carbon footprint from those things is also around energy. And even food, a lot of the uh, carbon footprint associated with food is, is also energy. So there's things you can do over here with the stuff you buy. Obviously, buy less of it, hold on to it longer. Buy from companies that are really authentically trying to reduce their footprint. And, and it's happening. They're out there. Um, and food, you know, there's a lot of things you can do. Buy food locally is a big one. Organic in general is going to have a lower footprint. And then there's a lot of exciting stuff going on with the re regenerative agriculture right now, which holds a lot of promise to, to create fewer emissions and even do a better job of storing um, carbon in, in the soil. Uh, so there's things you can do here, but I can tell you from personal experience that it's hard to do much more than chip away at this stuff over here with the stuff you buy in the food you eat. But the energy you buy, this you can take to zero. So I think the good news about this slide is the majority of our responsibility, it's quite easy to take care of. And we're gonna be talking about that today. We, as Joe mentioned, there's four steps, but we're gonna be talking mostly about electrifying your home, but it doesn't do a lot of, well, it, it, it helps. Even if you are just on regular old electricity, it's still gonna lower your footprint to electrify, but if you clean up your electric supply, you can take a huge chunk out of your emissions. And, and there's two advantages of this one. You know, first of all, it's pretty easy to do. There's green power plans available in almost anywhere in the country. If you can do rooftop, we highly recommend it. It doesn't work for everyone, but if you can, it's the best solution. And then in a lot of places here in Oregon included, community solar is, is, is more and more available. And that's a fantastic solution as well. All of these things will enable you to take a huge chunk out of your that electricity portion of your emissions. But importantly, for what we're gonna be talking about today, it sets you up so that now everything you plug into the wall, including your heating and your cooling and your water, is possible to, to get the benefits that you need with zero emissions. So that first step is pretty important. But today we're mostly gonna be talking about electrifying your home. And I wanna start out with just a little bit of myth busting because most of us have grown up with this idea of the clean blue flame, you know, natural gas, it's clean and efficient. And they've done an excellent marketing job of owning those words over the last, literally the last 50 years here in the United States. Couldn't be farther from the truth. The methane leaks that we are learning more about every day in terms of how badly our system actually leaks. leaks. And then of course the CO2 that's created from burning uh, fossil gas produces over a quarter of our emissions in the United States, and it's likely to be, I think, higher than that as we get better data about leakage. A lot of people who are on the front end of um, investigating leaking in our system are saying that natural gas is not a lot cleaner than coal in terms of its overall impact. So we got to get off this gas. And here in, in terms of us regular old people living in homes, and if you're heating your home with natural gas and if you've got gas water heater, you're likely creating about five tons of, of carbon emissions per year just by keeping your house warm and getting hot water to take showers, et cetera. So that's, what, that's why it's important to talk about this stuff. And the two big ones in your home are your gas furnace and your gas water heater. You know, three tons at least for your furnace could be as much as five or six, depending on where you live. And then a water heater, surprisingly, um, the second biggest one in your home, that's at least two. And again, if you've got a house full of young kids like I did, taking showers every day, maybe two showers a day, you know, it could be easily double that. So I know a lot of people have trouble understanding what a ton of carbon looks like. And so I just want to like, I, I found this helps for people because a lot of people kind of get plastic waste, right? It's like, right, it's, it's really tangible. It's in our face. And a lot of people talk about plastics waste and it's a big problem, but let's just imagine Let's just take this imaginary walk, you and I, down the street, and we come across this pile of plastics waste right in the sidewalk. And in that pile, there's a hundred of these plastic bottles that we all are used to that we get our water in. 
there's a hundred plastic shopping bags starting to be banned in places, but there's still a lot of them around there. hundred, hundred of those, hundred plastic forks, hundred plastic spoons, hundred plastic knives, a hundred of those plastic takeout containers that we get a lot of times. Those yogurt cups that we all use, a hundred of those as well. And sprinkled into this, something that gets a lot of airplay, a thousand plastic straws. So imagine we, we came across that pile, we'd be saying to ourselves, this is horrible. And it is terrible. And it's a problem. I don't want to sweep it under the rug. But most people would be shocked to know that that pile of garbage that come up to your knees creates about as much carbon emissions to, to, to make that plastic. It's actually far less than the amount of carbon that many of us are uh, emitting in one day by heating our homes and heating our water with natural gas. So I think most people would be shocked to know that that really visible pile is actually smaller in terms of its climate warming impact than one day of just living our lives in our homes with heating with gas. So that's why it's important to, to keep this in mind. I think one other visual for you before we turn it over to our panelists is that if you're having trouble imagining this, think about it this way. Every time you take a bath or a hot shower, imagine you're filling your tub up with plastics waste. That's pretty close to what the impact is in terms of carbon. So I hope that doesn't spoil your bath, but maybe it should if you're not heating your water uh, with a heat pump and electricity. All right, so that's why it's so easy to get excited about elect electrification though, is because we can have all these comforts that we're used to, a warm house or a cool house in the summer and hot water to take our showers. And there's no compromise in terms of that comfort and convenience, but also we can do this, particularly if you've done step number one and get clean energy in your home, you can do that with zero carbon emissions, which makes you, that hot shower feel even better, I can tell you. But it's not just about heating and cooling. There's other things that we'll touch on those today, you know, it's the way you cook your food, even barbecuing. Uh, the way, you know, a lot of us might have gas fireplace inserts. I know we had one, we switched to electric one. It's unbelievable how, how, how little you would even know if you didn't, if I didn't tell you, you would not know that it's electric. And then of course, things we're gonna be talking about, one of my favorites next month, um, outdoor power tools. So there's a lot of solutions and I can tell you every one of them is better than the gas thing they replace. So I wanna, turn it over to our two amazing panelists here. And I couldn't be more excited to have these two guys because if you could pick two people to talk about electrification in the United States, it would be these two people. If I ever have a tough problem about like, if somebody says, hey, how do I do a heat pump for my swimming pool? You know, I first person I call is Sean Armstrong, who's gonna be the first one to talk today. He's one of the most experienced electrification guys around. Uh, his firm, Redwood Energy, has kind of led the way in this idea of zero net energy home design and won tons of awards. Um, and like I said, if you've got a tough question, he's a great one to, to ask. Um, he's got a lot of materials on his website and some of the stuff he's going to be showing today is from some of these pocket guides and other materials he's developed to help people to electrify. Tons of information from him. And then I have to tell this story about Nate as I'm so excited to have Nate here. First of all, Nate's got this reputation as, as he's, some people call him the house whisperer. And it's because of all his deep experience with HVAC, a lot of it with older homes that can be really tricky. Um, and he's one of the first people that I came across when I was really diving into electrification. And hey, how come no, nobody's talking about heat pumps? It was like, Nate's talking about them. This was years ago. And he's been doing this for a, a long time and probably knows more about this in terms of the how to do it well particularly in single family uh, homes than, than almost anybody on the planet. He's had a lot of airplay. He was just recently in a really cool uh, podcast from the Energy Gang, but he's been in a, in a lot of different places that you'll see his name show up. So I'm super excited to have both of these guests with us today. And I'm gonna turn it over to Sean now to uh, take it away. Okay, if you could share, oh, there we go. Almost there then. And... Hey everybody. Okay, I'm going to make it big. And I'm going to tell my daughter over here, you have to turn down Pokemon just a little bit more. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to focus on rental housing. Here you can see on our website, redwoodenergy.net backslash research, three of the, the five guides that we've printed. And I'm going to be just providing a real skim level of some of the, the residential parts of, of these three booklets on how to do uh, rental housing. 
So single family retrofits, single family new construction and multifamily construction, all are building types you'd see in rentals. And I wanted to, to place this in history to remind you that um, electrification of buildings starts in about 1934 as an official government program, the Rural Electrification Administration during the depression. It grows in the 1950s, um, 180 utilities band together, hire Ronald Reagan. That was his first sort of big break into kind of popular politics was the 10 years he spent advertising on behalf of the utilities and running a, a top 10 television show during the 50s. And you saw ads like this everywhere. Families love to get together in the wonderful comfort of a total electric gold medallion home. I found one of these um, as a, a keychain on um, whatever eBay. And so now I have that, my total electric gold little medallion on my keychain. Here's an example of an early heat pump that General Electric put out. This is the Weathertron. You start seeing them in 1952. So this is not new. What I'm about to show you, this is at least 70 years old of, um, of organized effort by the utilities to spread the, the all electric construction type. Now, these are the things that you would normally see. Uh, I'm gonna talk about stoves in a moment, but these are the three of the big gas loads. So a dryer, a water heater, and a space heater. These are all efficient products, but they're hard because they're 240 volt to um, easily plug into someone's house. So 240 volt is the kind of electricity you see on a stove or an electric dryer generally. Uh, 120 volt is what's in all the rest of the outlets in your house. And these are efficient over the course of a year in their electricity consumption, but they're not very power efficient, which means they're instantaneous demand for electricity. So this electric resistance dryer, which is Energy Star, uses 7,200 watts when it's going full tilt. This heat pump water heater also is super efficient, but at peak, it's running 4,500 watts. And then this heat pump for space heating up to 7,000 watts. That's a lot of electricity to pull through a house. And one of the biggest challenges in retrofitting um, any house, providing a, a rental situation in apartments, electrifying them, is the fact that usually the power supply is too small to avoid an upgrade. But here's some options for you. So these are power efficient versions of the same appliances. So for instance, instead of 7,200 watts for the dryer, this is a 1200 watt dryer. This is what I have. Um, this is a condensing washer dryer. So it's one box, does a fantastic job washing the laundry, fantastic job drying the laundry. And this is the big model, like American style laundry, 4.5 cubic feet. So it looks like a normal size dryer, not like what you might've seen over in Europe if you've ever used a condensing washer dryer. They'll have like 2.0 cubic foot and it feels very small and Americans screw up their laundry when they go there on, on a vacation. Here's the heat pump water heater. Uh, there's three different manufacturers are coming out with 1,000 and 1,200 watts as opposed to 4,500 watts. And these are 120 volt. You can plug into any outlet in your house. I have one from Ream right now. I was just able to like extension cord, plug it in to the outside outlet on the, my patio, um, on my like back porch, you know, <laughs> little closet there. Um, it was wonderful. I didn't have to have like, didn't have to have an electrician there. This is going into a lot of my apartment complexes, the um, Ifoca, it's also called Innova. They're rebranding because uh, there's a company called Innovair out of Florida. Anyway, this is a 120 volt heat pump. It has an inverter, so it goes below freezing. It's silent type. You know, inverters make very quiet heat pumps. And this is the equivalent of a ductless mini split. Same amount of heating capacity, can do the same job, and is also 120 volt. It's really important that it, you be able to just plug in devices and not have them increase the electrical demand from the grid um, and still get the heating done. So these are all examples of what you might put into a rental, something that you, if you, if you wanna make your house you know, a jewel box, then maybe you wanna go with higher power devices. There's lots of them. If, you, if you're trying to get the job done of electrifying a house or a rental apartment, these are more the strategies that you should at least be considering. Now, um, in rentals, apartment complexes, this is what it looks like to replace the central gas domestic hot water boiler. It's like a big apartment complex cycling water through the building. And here are manufacturers like Colmac. Uh, this example, the Colmac, you can see this is the very coldest of the climates that you see here. And you would use this and it is a two-stage process. You'd heat up water to say 100 degrees with this. 
And then you'd put it into another Colmac heat pump water heater. Actually, not that one picture because that's air source, but it'd be water source. And to briefly show, you can do negative 30 Fahrenheit. That's here with one heat pump. This is the package of the heating capacity it has with the ambient outside air and the water temperatures that you're trying to get it to. It's called a cascading system. We're trying to get up to 180 Fahrenheit for space heating boilers. So you're in New York City replacing a boiler for an apartment complex that heats the radiators. You'd use a second heat pump to get the job done. You'd raise the water up to say, in this case, they have raising the water to 80 degrees Fahrenheit from negative 30. And then this heat pump would raise it from 80 Fahrenheit up to 180 Fahrenheit. So a cascading system is the technical phrase for that. You use one type of cold climate air source heat pump and then you use a water source heat pump to essentially concentrate the heat in the water as it's recirculating, concentrate it and get it up to 180, which is um, what a radiator might be using or 160, 180. Going back here, these are all just for central domestic hot water, the, the showering hot water. And a lot of different products that are out there that are available, Nile and A.O. Smith and Aramec and Yakawa and Colmac are the, the big ones. Now, I'm gonna talk quickly about cooking. So up here on the left, this is the 120 volt inexpensive version. This is what I cook on in my house. This is what I make lunch on. The drink pod, true induction. I've tried out almost all of the two burners that are just countertop plug in like a blender or a toaster induction ranges. This is my favorite. It's the quietest of them. Uh, it has you know, two burners that gets boil, water boiled and such. And then I use one of these single burner induction ranges. I have another cooking station in the kitchen. Um, and this is my oven, this Oster here two doors, cooks a chicken, cooks pizzas, cooks cookies, everything that you can want out of it. And we have an instant pot. Insulated cookware, in case you're curious, uses one fourth as much electricity to get cooking done as um, cooking on a, an uninsulated pot on an induction range. We did a whole bunch of field science on this. We're like, yep, it's real. Insulation's amazing. Uninsulated cooking wastes tons of heat. So crock pots and instant pots are both examples of a way that you can cook and reduce the cooking energy by three fourths. Um, the difference between say electric resistance, like these inexpensive countertop electric resistance and induction is the difference between about a 60 to 70% efficient heat transfer and a 70 to 90% heat transfer right. with induction. And for comparison, gas is between 20 and 35% efficient at converting the, the gas into the heat that's in the food. So you get two to three times as much air conditioning loads in kitchens that burn with gas because they just waste so much heat. They're so ineffective at taking the flame and getting that heat into the pot by comparison to resistance or induction. On the right hand side, these are rental, classic electric resistance rental. You have a smooth glass top, so you don't use the crummy ones with the coils. No one likes that. Really easy to clean. They're 500 bucks. Here is what you might have for a more high end um, these Frigidaires are $1,000, but then you get into like LG, a fancier Frigidaire, Samsung, GE. These are all in the 2000 plus range. And in case you're doing like a bed and breakfast, that's a version of a rental, like some sort of beautiful antique opportunity, like Smeg, Retro, Elmira, the Ilve, and AGA. Now I'm seeing questions come in. There's the question of what fireplace did we get? Um, I have, uh, I like the, the one that's um, Optimist, misspelled M-Y-S-T. Optimist is the one that makes um, flame-like mist that you light with LEDs. And I've just purchased one to play with here. So Optimist is sort of the, the great brand out there. Um, and, oh, Anonymous likes your plastic garbage, Brian. <laughs> Oopsie, here we go. So. These are your, your stove options, $500, 1,000 to 2,000, and then yeah, 2,500 up to 12,000, depending upon what kind of facility you have there. But I just want you to see there's the whole range of induction and, res and resistance from $140 to 12 grand. Pick your spot. Now, a reason to do that is that um, cooking on gas in your house has the same amount of air pollution impact as secondhand cigarette smoke. Now, if you were to imagine sticking the muffler of your car right up 
like a little pipe and tubing it into your kitchen. That's essentially what you're doing. This is just raw combustion of fossil fuels in your kitchen. And most hoods do a very poor job of capturing it. So you have all the effects of secondhand cigarette smoke on children with increased asthma rates, about 12% of asthma in children is caused by the gas stove. Um, you can see it in smaller apartments particularly because they have less air volume to solve the pollution problem with dilution. So you might need two or three times as strong of a hood in an apartment as you would in a house, but people don't do that. It's just the reverse. Frequently hoods in apartments don't even work and they're a recirculating system that has no effect on getting rid of nitrogen dioxide um, and not very much on part of PM 2.5. So it, it challenges lungs. Um, one of the, the number one source of formaldehyde in your house is the gas stove. So if you're worried about say your pets getting leukemia or for that matter, your children, uh, that is the number one source of formaldehyde is your gas stove. It's a combustion byproduct. And formaldehyde is that fluid that you float dead animals in and they last for hundreds of years because everything is killed by formaldehyde, including your own cell tissue. So stoves being a very high power demand are an example of what can be useful. Um, these are all circuit splitters. They're essentially 240 volt plug strips. I have one here. NeoCharge that's up there on the wall, the middle one, here's an example. So here you can see on the side a 240 volt plug. Here's the other one on the other side, the 240 volt plug, and here's what plugs into your dryer outlet. And now you can run a stove on one side and a water heater on another, heat pump water heater, or a dryer and a car charger, those kinds of things. And they do load balancing where they'll let both of them operate at the same time as long as it doesn't exceed the 30 amps at 240 volts um, that, it, that circuit's rated for. So Dryer Buddy, NeoCharge, um, EV PowerShare, specifically for EVs, right? Electric vehicles, Simple Switch. These are all in the range of like 200 to $600. Um, and they can save you a significant amount of money in rewiring and even upsizing your panel. And this, um, this is an example of how to think about this. The power savings you can get, it's really important so you don't have to do some big deal change out of a house or an apartment. You can have with those portable heat pumps, the Innova, the Efoca that I showed you, the, the wall-based heat pump, that has no impact on your circuit breaker panel versus adding a mini split that's one ton, that's three tons. That's a central system of three tons because the blower takes more energy to blow through ducts. And here's if you have resistance. 10,300 watts. Here's the heat pump water heaters. If you have the, the low power ones that I showed you, 360 watts that you see on, the, on your panel. If you have the high power one, 2000. There is, by the way, um, a diversity factor where you multiply the, the wattage by 0.4 and that's what the panel sees. So these wattages don't line up with what I was showing you. These are the ones that the panel sees according to the National Electrical Code. So countertop cooking, which is what we do, no power impact at all in your panel. Whereas other things like a built-in microwave that takes power at the panel, separate cooktops. The, the worst is to have a separate cooktop from the oven that, that makes both of those devices get counted. Here's your laundry condensing washer dryer that I showed. No impact on your circuit breaker panel or your power demand. So it's a 120 volt plug-in appliance versus a heat pump dryer, a condensing dryer and the resistance, whoopsie, resistance dryer. There's EV charging, the same thing. You can have low level charging, like one to six miles per hour of charging versus two to 15 miles per hour, two to 23 miles per hour and, uh, and 30 level two and 31 miles per hour. These are the, the speed at which you can charge and that's the power demand. And note here, this is power savings available for using something like uh, the dryer buddy or the Neo charge. And there's even ones that are for apartment complexes, particularly um, called the DCC9, that can uh, do more whole panel monitoring and only use car charging potential when the panel is up to 80% of capacity, then it'll stop car charging, I should say. So you can get even more power flexibility from a DCC9. These resources are in the, those books that I showed at the beginning. Now, how this works out. This is a 3,000 square foot house running on 100 amp panel. That's a smaller panel. They started installing those in the 60s. Nowadays, people would usually have a 200 amp panel, but if you don't want to or can't upsize the panel in the service, 
This is what your panel would look like, all normal stuff here in blue. And then you'd see something like the Neo charge right here, balancing power between a resistance dryer and a heat pump water heater. And you'd see it again, balancing power between the electric range and your car charger, so that when you're cooking, it doesn't charge the car. People only cook about 45 minutes a day tops. We studied 500 apartment comp, 500 apartment units, and that's that's how people cook, maximum 45 minutes a day. So that's the maximum that you wouldn't be able to use your car charger, which is a very modest amount. Um, and you still have enough power in your panel for solar array. Um, and then you use a ductless heat pump. This is on this one, the strategy to avoid that blower energy. But this is a whole house on a 3000 square foot house on hundred amps with just a couple plugs, basically plug shares to, which are legal, UL listed, legit to, um, to make it all work. Hey, Sean, sorry, just on that backside, I, I, I wanted to jump in a little bit on this because uh, we've been having a few questions in the chat on this. Maybe we just do it right now while, while, while we're here. Yes. This is a really important topic and, and maybe just to make sure people are understand why this is so important is because one of the barriers to electrifying your home can be your electric panel and that can be expensive. And, you know, so if you have somebody come to your house and say, well, yeah, we could do that, but then you'd have to put a whole new, we'd have to upgrade your your panel yeah. and what might that cost, Sean, if you upgrade your panel, what, what might that cost? So it's $600 to $3,000, depending upon your electrician and your market. And then there's also the service upgrade, which is another $1,000 to $3,000. Right. So you can be on the hook for $2,000 to $6,000 in order to upgrade your wiring. And, and even running a new 240 volt circuit someplace, as opposed to using the existing 120 volt, that's at least $300 up to $600 just for the wire, assuming yeah. you didn't have to upgrade the panel or the electrical service to the house. So, so that's why this, that's why these workarounds are so important is because, you know, if you're in a new home with a new 200 amp panel, it might not be a problem. But if for a lot of older homes, particularly, I think, wouldn't you say, Sean, that oh, this yeah. retrofit thing can be a problem where you just don't have the panel space. And so then, then you're into these expensive upgrades, but these workarounds can be really fantastic. So um, I just wanted to emphasize yeah. that while we were here. And there's also the time savings, like you, your water heater breaks, you want to get a new water heater that day. Well, mm -hmm. if you have a 120 volt plug-in version, then all you need is the plumber to bring the water heater and then plug it in. If you have to get a 240 volt 30 amp circuit dedicated and delivered to that spot, then you have to have an electrician and a plumber show up and it's hard to get two people on the same day. And so like the delays, tons of delays that you can avoid, um, time delays by, by going with 120 volt versions. Um, you know, this condensing washer dryer, just plug it right in. Water heater, plug it right in. You got an HVAC system, just plug it right in. That's no awesome. drama. Yeah, I'm mean, happy to go into more details there. Um, well, this, I do think we should give Nate a lot of chance yeah. to get to the Q and A, but yeah. Last slide. So this is a tiny house that I, I've had built. Um, so here's the tiny bathroom. Here's the tiny house. It's 145 square feet house, 32 square foot bathroom. And you can see here, this is a, a 120 volt electric resistance tank under this sink. Here's the two burner induction range. Here's the tiny little oven. And I was able to, um, I well insulated the house, etc. So this took very little power off of our, our main circuit. I didn't have to do any you know, upgrades and such, but I have a whole house there. And so that's an example of you know, 30 amps as opposed to 100 amps. There we go. I will stop and let Nate take the floor. <laughs> that's great stuff, Sean. Um, I'm glad that you, you did some nuts and bolts stuff because I'm gonna go back out a little bit and then zoom back in. Uh, let's see here, I need to take over. There we are. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Sweet. Okay. So uh, uh, I've, I've been watching the chat, by the way. There's some very good questions in there that we'll tackle after this, uh, as many as we can get to. So I'm going to try and buzz through this a little bit. Uh, so I wanted to talk about cold climates and contractor needs. So uh, first, I wanted to take a step back in time to how we figured out that you can electrify uh, a house in a cold climate. And like most things, it's an accident. 
um, you know, like the rubber tires got figured out because somebody bumped a, a, a beaker over onto a Bunsen burner and the, the rubber actually became something usable. They've been trying to figure it out. So same thing here. Uh, this is my business partner, Ted Kidd's house, uh, sorry, his mom's house in Rochester, New York. And uh, well, this is like 2010 or so. He uh, installed a three ton heat pump at a 60,000 BTU modulating furnace in her house. Uh, so there is the outdoor unit. And then here's the fellow installing the gas furnace, but uh, there was an issue. So Ted gets a call on a design day. Uh, so design temperature is a temperature that you design HVAC to in whatever climate. So you only spend 1% of the year or about 90 hours a year below that temperature or above that temperature on the heating side. So in Rochester, it's five degrees. So it was a five degree day and Ted's mom calls him and says, hey, Teddy, uh, everything's okay. The house is holding temperature, but the air coming out of the vents is really cold. And his mind, uh, he, he's, he's very much like a computer. And he's like, click, click. Okay, they, they uh, didn't turn the gas uh, valve on. So that house had been heating the whole time, 2,500 square foot house, Rochester, New York, you know, 40 years old now. It had been heating the whole time with a heat pump. And he's like, so why do we even have a furnace? This is dumb. And his mom was really comfortable in her house. So uh, uh, it, it was just kind of an accident that that happened. And so to answer the question, do heat pumps work in cold climates? Well, all of these are running right now on heat pumps in the Cleveland area. Um, this is some of the electrifications that we've done. Uh, so I, I, I think we can answer yes. And by the way, I will note the top four up here these are all century homes. So the newest one here is this one, which is 1918. Um, so it can be done. Now, these did get pretty substantial shell upgrades, uh, insulation and air sealing, but it can definitely be done. Um, and then to Sean's point, two of these have 100 amp panels. So this one and this one. Uh, so this one was tricky. Um, so this client, so this is my Volt. Um, and this is her Volt, which she now has a, a second gen one. But uh, the panel was over here, the, the main breaker, and then the panel was inside of her house and the line ran underneath the concrete slab. So mm -hmm. it was really borderline in being able to do this. So uh, she has a heat pump water heater, put that in. Um, uh, so that those pull about 400 watts in general. And she has a small backup strip, but uh, she has a very good cold climate heat pump. So it's never hit resistance. Uh, so she's fine on that. So it can be done, but you have to pay attention and you have to be careful. Uh, 200 amp is easy in just about any house, like say up to 3000 square feet. It's basically when you go to two HVAC systems, things start to get challenging, but until then you're fine. Um, so, but here's the problem we spent all this time figuring out how to do these projects, but what we really need is a replicable system because me and my partner in Rochester and Cleveland, Ohio, you know, the 10 or 20 houses a year we can do, it doesn't matter. Um, we're building a million new homes a year. There's about a hundred million existing single family homes in the U S. So we, we need something where this can be done at a uh, real scale. Um, so to talk about that, which is getting into the HVAC 2.0 program, there's really only two key parties when it comes to home electrification. It's the homeowners who write the checks and the contractors who sell and do the work. Um, sorry, utilities, um, you know, sorry, governments, um, you don't actually matter. You usually just get in the way. <laughs> um, uh, so it, make sure that you are making the kitchen table transaction good. And here's an important point. Um, here's one for uh, all of the Princess Bride fans out there. Um, electrification is a land war. So there's 105,000 HVAC contractors in the US and there's well over 100 million homeowners because there's 100 million uh, homes out there that are single family. So this is something that one by one, everybody has to be convinced and also one by one, everybody needs an individual 
solution because no two homes are exactly alike. Um, I, back in my installation days, there was a housing neighborhood of 200 homes that looked all identical from the outside. There were a bunch of, uh, they were, they're actually electric, um, uh, electric um, condominiums. No two were the same. None of my bids were the same on all those houses. Uh, we did 50 of them. So this is what we call the church of the kitchen table where you all watching are the homeowners. So your interests and then the contractor interests, they rule over all when it comes to uh, electrification. So it's very important. So uh, we're gonna talk plenty of, uh, about what you all want, but uh, you know, our work is heavily about finding a way to make contractors happy doing this. Because if a contractor doesn't wanna do something or doesn't wanna sell something, they can stop it cold. We watch it all the time. You pretty much can't buy a heat pump in Chicago, third largest city in the US. Uh, a couple of our guys are there and they're like, yeah, we have to order it weeks in advance. It has to come from Minnesota or Wisconsin or something like that. They, they just aren't stocked. So what contractors want, they want easy sales. They want it to be profitable. They don't want to get a lot of callbacks and they want to have happy clients so that they get referrals. Um, these are a bunch of things. They also, they love solving problems. Um, most HVAC contractors are at heart really good mechanics. So they love doing that. But here's what they're seeing now. And I, I'm seeing lots and lots of Twitter threads on this where uh, people are going out and trying to find someone to help electrify their house and they're just hitting a wall. Um, this is why. So from a contractor perspective, they're looking at it and they're seeing this is gonna be a hard sale to make. There's gonna be a lot of time here. My margin's gonna stink. Um, I'm worried about using new equipment. So there's going to be a callback risk. And I'm also worried about getting bad reviews. So until we solve these issues for contractors, they're not gonna move and they're the ones doing the work. Um, and it's not easy to come up with a brand new contractor ecosystem. Not if we wanna get rolling, you know, like you know, 10 years ago. <laughs> Definitely today. Uh, so here is one of my favorite quotes. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete uh, from Mr. Buckminster Fuller. So I love that quote. Um, so if we're going to create a new paradigm, what do we do? The nice part is we have the technology with the exception of high temperature boilers, which it does exist. Um, and I, I, big kudos to Sean and his student assistants for finding that cascading boiler that can make 180 degree water. Um, that's, that's amazing, that's a big deal. Uh, but that's not mature yet, but at least it exists. But everything else, we have the technology to do this. Now we just need people to go do it. And this is kind of a, a blatant plug, but you can find another way to do this too. So I'm just saying we found one. Uh, so sales process at the end of the day ends up being the key. It's a business model problem. Um, so this will be one of the very few things Jigger Shaw and I won't argue over. Um, every time we chat, we just argue. Uh, so the key to this though, is we want to deliver excellent experiences for both contractors and homeowners. If we can do that, we're, we're creating that new paradigm. We're making things better. And the good news is, as been, has been mentioned a couple times, all of the electric options today are better than their fossil fuel counterparts. And that is brand new. That has happened in the last couple of years, five years, 10 years max. Uh, so it's cool that all of this is coming to the fore and renewable electricity has become basically the cheapest form of energy mankind's ever known. All of this is happening at the same time. So it's good. We're going to see a very interesting decade. But I do want to caution everyone. So when I think of residential electrification, this is very much what I picture in my mind. Uh, I picture a very narrow path on a mountain ridge where there's pretty much certain death to the left or to the right. So this is not an easy thing to do. Um, it's a narrow path. So we want to pay attention to it. And the biggest thing uh, is to pay attention to what homeowners need and what contractors need. If we can do that, we're much more likely to succeed. So here's the pieces of the puzzle we have to solve. Um, so consumer education, hey, we're here today doing consumer education. This is great. Um, maybe there's a contractor or two on here. So thank you to Joe and Brian. Um, we need contractor education because they need to be comfortable with the new technologies. And a lot of them aren't, particularly in Northern climates. And Northern climates are really important. Fully half of US residential natural gas is used in 11 cold climate states. 
So we can't solve this unless we deal with cold climates, period. Um, so, uh, so I know a guy though. Uh, sales process, we have to uh, tackle. It needs to be a better business model. They need to make more money and have more fun for this to work. We need transparency through a system so that you can actually see what real performance is and uh, that weeds out bad actors, good for consumers. And then it needs to be scalable, whatever it is, because we, we need to be, uh, I mean, we need to be doing 3 million homes a year, like now, uh, uh, it's, it needs to move quick. And here's the other tricky part, which is why we think most of the programs, well, actually really all the programs out there have failed to do this. All of these problems have to be solved simultaneously without silos. Um, as soon as you silo these, your, your odds of success drop off a cliff. So hopefully the program that we're building will do this. So is this HVAC 2.0? Um, early signs are looking pretty good, but I don't know. There, I'm sure there are other paths, but we have spent a decade trying to find this one and it's, it has not been an easy find. Um, uh, if, if you want to spend a long time and not make a ton of money, um, it, try and solve problems like this. <laughs> so uh, last couple of slides here. Now I want, now I want to focus back on you all uh, as the homeowners and myself as the homeowner. So when it comes to electrification, I want to highly encourage everyone here to think about why they want to do it. So this is the Venn diagram from what we call a comfort consult. We want to understand what the client's goals are, what their house needs, and what their budget is. And in the middle is a viable project or a sweet spot. So this is where we at least have decent odds of something happening. Um, the curse is if you are doing this for electrification reasons only, you're going to be much more likely to cheap out and get a mediocre result and not have something that's worth trumpeting about. Uh, and you may be far too likely to get made fun of by other people behind your back. Like it needs to be a good experience if you're going to show this to other people. And another important point, um, which uh, I'll touch on uh, if you take the Electrify Everything course, um, it's really important to uh, not talk early adopter to most of your friends because almost everyone here is going to be an early adopter. You, you want to do this before most people. Um, that's not good language to talk to the rest of the market. So 84% of the market is not an early adopter and they need to understand why it's better and how it's not more trouble. Um, and then uh, coming back to the why, here are the four questions that we ask people about. Basically, are there rooms that don't heat well? Are there rooms that don't cool well? Does anyone in the house have a health issue that's uh, breathing related? So usually it's asthma and allergies. And are there any moisture problems in the house now or in the past? So leaking water, uh, mold issues, things like that. So those are really important to begin to define um, and to think about what problems you have and what they're worth to fix. Uh, because the, the higher you can get your budget, the more likely a good experience is to be. And then quick plug here, the Electrify Everything course, I put this out in February, it's free. It's a dozen emails. We're, uh, Sean and I uh, are just touching mountaintops today. That's all we're doing. We're just glancing the very tips. So uh, this goes quite deep into kind of our way of thinking. And also you can see what actual houses look like and you'll get all kinds of nuts and bolts detail. Uh, Brian, I made you a specific link. I'll send it to you. And then also I highly recommend uh, Sean's pocket guide uh, to all electric retrofits. This is really good. Um, uh, so this is very nuts and bolts. So we tend to be a, a little bit more theoretical and process oriented and Sean's very nuts and bolts. Here's the different things you can buy. Uh, so very important to have both sides. And it's nice to have friends in the, in the industry like this. And that's what I've got. So let's dig into some questions. That's that's fantastic. Um, hey, I I um I wanted to poke in a little bit on the um, you know, you were highlighting some of the questions that the country is going to have in order to electrify quickly because of some of the realities that you're very aware of in terms of the contractor base, etc. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to flip that around just a little bit, and so if you're a uh, because I, I totally agree with you. I've had those personal experiences myself here where, you know, you can call five people and the first two, first four will tell you you're crazy until you found somebody who's willing, even willing to do it. And then you're not sure they're going to do a good job, maybe. So I, I'd like to, 
ask maybe, do you have any advice, either of you for, uh, you know, here, if you're living in Oregon or Portland, go to Electrify now because we'll tell you who to work with because we've done a lot of that work for you. But if, you know, if you're just somebody's, depending on where you live and you're, you're not sure how you find a good, a, a contractor that might be able to really help you with this, um, do you have any tips for, for people about that? Yeah, I'd, I'd say that, you know, all heat pumps are, are air conditioners that work in reverse. So any air conditioning contractor out there is installing heat pumps just by a different name. And that can be a simple translation. The, the, the trick is, is that the, the heating loads in the winter time are different from air conditioning loads. And that's something that Nate would be able to speak to more, but just on the question of who's a contractor, the air conditioning contractors are heat pump contractors. Um, plumbing contractors are heat pump water heater contractors. You know, they put in electric resistance water heaters all the time. That's um, like half of the water heaters it's the majority of water heaters installed since 1950 have been electric in our country. So the fact that they're an electric water heater that also has a compressor, a heat pump on it, the main difference is that it has a condensate drain of the water that dribbles, the, the atmospheric condensate distilled water that dribbles out of it. That's the main difference. And then there's this question of where does it get warm air from, the house, the outside, et cetera. Uh, Nate, want to take a turn on that one? Um, so I'll come at it a different way. Uh, I mean, we're, we're purposely building, I mean, the HVAC 2.0 model is meant to be something. So we'll have a, a full contractor network it's still early, but one of the easiest ways to find contractors to work with is to choose whatever brand HVAC you're thinking about doing, call a distributor that sells that model or that brand, and then uh, ask them who buys a lot of the high-end equipment. So you'll need to know the model number. Uh, so like uh, we used a lot of carrier green speed equipment. So, and that's, that's how I found people to begin with. Um, it, I called a supply house who, who installs a lot of green speeds and I got a couple of numbers and I went from there. So that's a strategy you can use to shortcut, just go in eeny, meeny, miny, mo down the yellow pages or now Google. Um, cause that's not an easy thing. Now the heat load thing that you were mentioning, that's critical. So this is why people are afraid of it. If you electrify an old house, like the four that I showed at the top, um, in fact, I know, because the, the one, Sean, that you put on the cover of your uh, electrification guide, John and Kelly's house, yep. we did HVAC first, and then a year later, we actually did shell work. Oh. They used 20,000 kilowatt hours, uh, actually, it was 24,000 kilowatt hours uh, for the year before we, we did the shell work, and now they're down to twelve. Woo. that's all resistance electric. So thousand dollar electric bills in January and February in cold climates are very likely if you don't do your homework. Um, so this is a really important point. So that's why you want to understand how leaky a house is and you want to see its annual usage before you go and just change it out willy nilly. Um, and in general, in my climate, uh, heat loads are double what cooling is. So if it's a four ton heat load house, it's, it's about a two ton cooling. Um, and so that also makes things really challenging on the dehumidification side. So there's a lot of little details. Like if you're in the West Coast, you don't care. You don't have humidity. But here, if you go and you oversize a heat pump, you're gonna turn that house into a house of mold um, and you're gonna hurt people. So it, it's a health and safety problem, very key. Oh, nice. Um, you see that? I'm showing a slide to try to help illustrate this. The role of yeah. air leakage and heat pumps so this is negative five Fahrenheit, zero, 10 degrees Fahrenheit, 2030. And in black here, you're seeing, this is the energy demand. If you have a, an air exchanges of one per hour, this is at actual atmospheric pressure, not like a lower door high pressure, just yeah. normal real world. That's very leaky. That, that's like 1920s kind of house. Right, super leaky. And so you can see the, the decrease in the power demand and the, and the heating load as you you weatherize it or you insulate it down to 0.3 ACH. What would you describe that as in, in normal world? Uh, like um, That's like a 1990 to today kind of house. So fairly standard new construction. Um, so it's not crazy these, tight, but it's not loose. These big drops in, in the energy demand and the power demand. So on the left-hand side, that's the BTUs of heating needed. On the right-hand side, that's the, the amperage, the running amps of the power demand and under different climate regimes, but basically you can see there's a significant drop in, in power and heating demand as you just tighten the building. That's 
what this slide's supposed to illustrate. Hey guys, a follow up on that question. Uh, Dean is asking. He doesn't know if uh, if he or she can get their their nineteen or their eighteen ninety year old house with asbestos single shiting insulated well enough to replace gas heating with an air source heat, heating cooling system. I mean, is every house capable of electrification? Um, or uh, Nate, do you want to talk at all about hybrids um, as an option? Or yeah, yeah, sure. Um, well, I can tackle both of those. So for starters, yes, John and Kelly's hey. house was asbestos siding. Um, so, uh, that, that got removed or remediated, um, uh, but that, that got paid for by insurance. So that was lucky. They, they had a bad storm. Um, oh, love it, Sean. And then, uh, hybrids that, that is hybrids are very much the belt and suspenders solution. Uh, so a hybrid is a heat pump on top of a furnace. So right now, if you have air conditioning in a furnace, you, you have the same stuff. You just change what's on top of the furnace to be a heat pump. So the furnace just serves as backup for the most part. Um, and in fact, uh, we have a policy proposal that's about to hit the streets in the next week or two uh, on just that, paying the manufacturers to stop making air conditioners and only make heat pumps so that everyone gets a hybrid at a minimum. Here you have uh, Mr. Cool, which is an American made heat pump. They're showing how they, this is a 1941 R13 walls, 1500 square foot, so this is an old house that's not been retrofitted, hasn't been insulated. You know, they're in there installing a Mr. Cool, which is a, an inverter only heat pump. And so it doesn't have electric resistance backup. And they ran it at negative 24 Fahrenheit. They're up all night, uh, you know, bragging on this thing. Which shows the zip code is... Uh... Anyway, so it's super cold outside. It's negative 24 and it's 70 degrees Fahrenheit inside the house. They spent a bunch of time walking around with infrared cameras in this little video. And I'm going to put this in the chat. So if anyone wants to watch it, you're welcome to. Hey, just uh, following up on that, because there's a question about, because I think we're, we're maybe we're, we're talking about this here without naming it, but, you know, uh, heat pumps are going to come in all sorts of levels of sort of efficiency and uh, capability, if you want to think of it that way, in terms of how much heat they can provide as the temperature drops, right? So the equipment itself is going to vary depending on you know, what's the demand. So I'd, I'd like you guys to touch a little bit on this kind of idea of the cold climate heat pumps, which, which is a terminology that's out there a little bit. I think it basically just refers to really efficient systems, but um, can you touch on that? And, and I'm sure there's a price thing that, that's related to that as well, isn't it in terms of when you get to these yeah. more efficient systems? There's, there's definitely a big cost difference. You're talking two, three, four times the equipment cost. Um, so, they're two thousand dollars to five thousand dollars more just for the equipment. So you, you'll probably get charged more for the install as well. But just for the equipment, that's uh, the ballpark range. Uh, but the the key that I have seen, because um, I've I've plotted the the performance of a whole bunch of different heat pumps out there. Um, if it doesn't overclock the compressor, and I'll get to that in a minute, they're all basically the same. So they all have a slope where at five degrees, they're all putting out somewhere between 40 and 50% of rated output. That's what they're down to. So uh, like Mitsubishi has the hyperheat model, and then all of the mini split brands have their equivalent. So, you know, it's it, hyperheat's like Kleenex, um, their tissues. Uh, it's just a brand name. Uh, but all of those models, what they do is they actually overclock the compressor. So normally a three ton heat pump uh, is going to use about 3000 watts, give or take, and they'll allow putting in five or 6,000 watts and they actually spin it at a higher RPM. So a little bit technical, but you're, you're driving it beyond what it normally would do. Um, and that allows them to maintain rated output to very low temperatures. So zero or minus 15, depending on the brand. Uh, so it's possible. Now the only unitary one that I know that does that is the carrier green speed. That's it. They're the only one, their, their performance is head and shoulders above everybody else. I don't care what everybody else says. I've looked at all the specs. It's the best one for unitary. Uh, now the good news is in recent times, uh, we're seeing the, the mini split, which uh, that's the outdoor units that are, uh, they're like a rectangle on the outside. They blow sideways where unitary blows up in general for the outdoor unit. Uh, and we're now starting to see the manufacturers mix a unitary uh, air handler, which is, it looks like a furnace. So uh, uh, 
in fact, a number of systems. To ducks, unitary means. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 it's just connected to ducks, exactly. So a, a couple of the, the units that we sold were at an Electrify Everything event and two clients just touched the unit. They're like, oh, it looks like a furnace and the outside looks like an air conditioner. Yeah, let's do this. It was familiar. Um, that's what they needed. That's what the mass market needs is something to be familiar. Uh, so, but the manufacturers are starting to mix mini split outdoor units with these killer performance with unitary indoor. And so that's going to be very interesting to watch over the next couple of years. Yeah. Here, so, I, I, these are examples of, of um, like the higher it goes down to negative 31 Fahrenheit. You know, Fujitsu, their coldest one is negative 15. These are rated temperatures. They actually can go colder, but that's the coldest they get rated at. And like an example of the hybrid that um, Nate was speaking to, this Mr. Cool, outside it has this horizontal, like it blows air in front, as you're saying, as opposed to up. Yeah. <laughs> but on the inside, it has that standard furnace looking air handler that um, you know just pops right into where the existing gas furnace is mm -hmm. and <clears throat> gets a job done. And this one is rated to negative 22, but that little video I put in the, the link the, in the Zoom chat, mm -hmm. that shows that it's at 70 Fahrenheit inside when it's negative 24 outside. So definitely doable. Nate, I know you, you've, you've said before that, um, that you think that, uh, you know, there's the, you know, the climate zones maps that we have in the United States. I don't know if any of you guys have one handy, but I know, Nate, you've got a point of view about, you know, there's some places where it's just a no-brainer, and then there's other places where you might have to get into this other kind of equipment. That could be really helpful um, just as a conversation with people because, you know, you know, in most, I think, but to paraphrase it, in most of the United States, the heat pump's going to work just fine. But there are these places where this more sophisticated equipment might be necessary. Yeah, exactly. I'm looking for a decent sized map here, and then I'll put it up. Now, Michael Van Schardenberg, you have a question of, I live in a 100 unit multifamily co-op building in New York City and I'm on the board. Who can you point me to for the communal needs? Um, Block Power is sort of your famous example mm -hmm. there in New York City. Um, They're amazing, yeah. Yeah, so Block Power is an organization that specifically focuses on New York City co-ops on electrifying them, getting heat pumps in. And uh, I will send you, I'll put a link here for you so you can follow up with them. They have a big staff. They've gotten yep. into like New York Times and things like that for, um, it's Donald Baird, I think is the leader there, Block Power. There we go. I'm gonna quickly just share my screen so y'all can see that. Thank you. Oh, here, I'll, I did the same. On here uh, I'll stop, you, you, can, you can hop off, uh, go ahead. Uh, okay, well, very quickly then. Thanks, bud. Um, here you go. Block power. BLOC power. Increase your building's profitability with a modern heating and cooling system. And they do PV paired with heat pumps all day long. Okay, back to you, Nate. Oh, no worries. Tag teaming here today. Yeah, I'm going to put block power into the chat for y'all. Okay, can you all see the climate zones? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is not the highest resolution one. It said it was higher than it is. Uh, but uh, so climate zone one is Miami, basically, and Hawaii. That's it. Climate zone two is all through here. Um, three goes across Texas and across to the coast. Four gets fairly close to me, um, uh, but it gets into Cincinnati. It uh, goes through a bunch of Missouri. You know, St. Louis is here. Uh, it, heat pumps work really well in one through four with existing technology, with older technology. Um, climate zone five can be tackled pretty easily now with uh, uh, the, the inverter driven heat pumps. And you can get into climate zone six. To do climate zone six and run heat pump only, you gotta be pretty tight. Like it's, uh, it, it, it's definitely some work, but a hybrid will work all day long. Uh, basically heat pumps work quite well down to zero Fahrenheit. So when you get into a climate that spends a lot of time below zero, they start to choke. Um, and like Minneapolis spends a couple of weeks a year below zero. So it's just a hard climate. It just is. Uh, it can be done though. Um, I know a number of people, in fact, one of our contractors, um, he built his own house and he went all electric in his and he loves it. So, and he is- so they Just building on that. So say you live in Minneapolis and you got a lot of cold days. So you put this hybrid system in Mm -hmm. You know, I think what, what I hear you saying is that, you know, basically it means you're going to be running gas like a few, maybe a, a week or a year. two weeks a year. Yeah. And the whole rest of the time, you're going to be really comfortable, cool in the, in the summer and warm in those shoulder seasons. 
with your heat pump. Is that, that kind of basically? Or, right? or get a heat pump that's specific to those extra cold temperatures, which is a subset. Right. Like I, I think we should be getting rid of all the gas in the buildings. And I know that that- I, I agree. I think, I think we all agree it would be nice to get rid of the gas, but I have to say, you know, and, and Nate's convinced me a little bit about this is that if you're not comfortable going there right now, um, go for the hybrid system because, and then, you know, the technology is going to get better and better and better, but you won't be using your gas very much, which is better than not having gas or, or better than uh, using a lot of gas. It's best not to have gas. I think we would agree, but- Sean, I'm with you. This took me a long time to come around to. <laughs> It's painful, um, uh, but it, most people are just not going to go do it. They're not going to be comfortable. And then if we get them that thousand dollar electric bill, they're going to be screaming um, and they're going to need 20, 30, 40, 50, 70 thousand dollar retrofits on their house to get it to where you can do that. But we can do hybrids right now. Um, and the couple of hybrids that we've done, uh, they use 80 to 90 percent less gas than they did pre-project. Right. So that's pretty good. I, looking at this map, though, you got to, I think we, you know, with the zones one through five, you're talking about 90% of the population in this country. So, you know, from yep. a, there's going to be regions where it might be tricky, but from a population standpoint, you're talking about all, yep. all the big cities, you know, all the big population yep. centers. Basically, so. Minneapolis is the biggest city, I think, that is in a cold climate. Hey, a question, guys. Um, uh, so Gary wants to know, how would you electrify a house with hydronic heating? I, I did this in my garage with, the, with just attaching it to my heat pump water heater. Um, it's got 300 square foot space. It's got hydronic heating in the floors. Do you guys have any uh, recommendations on that? That is the hardest application. Um, so it depends on what your radiators are. If you have low mass radiators, um, that's going to be really tough. Um, so if you have slant fin radiators, uh, because those require 180 degree water and there are no commonly available heat pumps that can get you above about 155. Uh, so you have to change the radiators out usually to do that. Um, now, if you can handle lower temperature water, yes, there's water to, or air to water uh, heat pumps out there. Uh, like take a look at chill tricks, uh, but none of them are large volume at this point. So you're going to be in for an early adopter experience. So, you know, be ready for weird commissioning issues, weird things breaking. Um, it's going to be expensive. Um, like that's, that is the, the big technical hole that we have right now. There is no great uh, solution for it. In fact, that was one of the reasons I sold my last house. Um, it, was, uh, it, was just, it was just a hard one. Oh, great. Okay, here's here's a here's a brand question. I don't know whether we want to go here or not, but do you guys have a point of view about you know the you know the the better brands in terms of water heaters, heat pump water heaters? You guys have experience with that? Um, it, it, I, we've had good luck with Ream, um, but we've got one AO Smith in, and it's been fine thus far. Uh, but there, there's only like three makers of them, so. Uh, one, one curse the ream right now though the the newest generation that just came out has kind of a noisy fan it was dead silent and now they make some racket i've um, i've been on the, i've been paying really close attention to that issue and i've because i've heard some of the same things and it seems like they the, some of the early uh production models were problematic that way and i'm hearing that it's getting better that they've sort of figured out what was wrong um, it was a fan. That was an yeah. issue with some of the early installations. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've got one. Um, by the way, one solution, if you do have one, which is what I've done, is I uh, raise the temperature in the middle of the night. So I set it to 140 degrees at two in the morning. So I'm soundly asleep at that point. And it doesn't wake me up and it lifts the, the water to 140. Um, and then the rest of the day, I run it at 120. And it runs a lot less that way when I notice. Yeah. There he is. Yeah, it's, I, I'm supposed to be in another meeting, but I postponed it. So the question of hydronic space heating. So we just wrote up a whole report on how to do that, right? Um, so far as like the products, the design strategies, et cetera. So yes, you can do hydronic heating. Yes, you can do it up to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, as I mentioned, that cascading system slide I showed where you air source heat pump combined with the water source heat pump. If you really had to do negative 30 Fahrenheit up to 180 Fahrenheit, that's how you do it. Um, but chill tracks, space pack, air mac, um, yeah. transom, 
<sighs> Stiebel Eltron, there's a whole bunch of them that make air to water heat pumps that are specifically for space heating with um, radiant floors being the lowest temperature. That's the easiest yep. one to do. And then you go up to air handlers, which is okay because that's 130 Fahrenheit. But mm -hmm. past 130 Fahrenheit, then you really need to be thinking about well, for instance, different radiators, they make low temperature radiators that work as low as 80 Fahrenheit. Big. Yep, yeah. bigger, more, more surface area, basically. So you can run lower temperature air through it or with air handlers, like a fan that would essentially increase the action of, of distributing heat. So if you need that, um, you should email me. Um, I'm going to put this in the... <laughs> that's, the that's the best answer right there. Yeah, because for all your questions. Yeah, be able to help you. Yeah. Um, um, hey, Brian, I was thinking we, well, there's, I, I have one good question if you have one too. Go, go, for, go ahead. Go ahead, Joe. Um, go. This is KM's putting one in at the end, which I think is a great way to either be our last, second to last or last question. Um, they're saying that Sean had said in another presentation, you know, it's the, a cost estimate is 10 to 60K to go all electric for a house. In my personal experience, I found it to be less than that. But um, is it possible to, to stay within that range? Do you guys, uh, do you have any rules of thumb on how to, on how to keep electrification, um, keep the cost down? Oh, well, I put out there that the, the least expensive it could go is about three grand. And the most of that cost would be the, the um, water heater. But you could get like about $300 worth of cooking equipment, which is what I have. And then you have your HVAC system and you could put in like Nate ran his house on a portable heat pump. But mm -hmm. you just replaced that, but for a couple of years, you had your house on a, on a portable heat pump. I got to bring it down here. <laughs> um, and portable heat pumps are a real thing. I, I tested out like three or four of them. Uh, let me share the screen here so people can see what that is. And we found that the winter was the best. We tested them out. That was our favorite in, in distributing heat. But these are not hmm. particularly efficient heat pumps, and they're not for below 15 degrees Fahrenheit, but they can still work at 20 Fahrenheit. Um, but you definitely, you are basically running on electric resistance at the coldest temperatures, but they're just fine for the fall and for milder climates. Um, you just put the, the, the vent hose in your window and you run, that's how and you And so Sean, that would, that would be heating one room, correct? With that device and maybe- You, you can do the house. Oh, no, right? I, I did my that would do my house down to about 40 degrees on its own and um, when you say your house so are you connecting it to your duct somehow or are you just a, a lot yeah, of relying on you know the distribution I, I don't have any ducts in that house um, it's all electric resistance baseboard um, mm -hmm. and uh, we blew the money we were going to spend on HVAC on the house I'm sitting in now so <laughs> it's going to wait a little bit longer before it gets the proper HVAC system uh, but uh, yeah, I just set it in the living room, central in the house, uh, and it does the job. So that can totally work, like particularly for apartments. If you're in an apartment, don't feel powerless. You can do stuff like that. Uh, for houses in cold climates, you're not going to do roll around. Um, so to answer the ten to sixty thousand dollar question, the the critical piece, and you know, the projects that I showed were all in that range. Um, uh, typically like 30 or 40 thousands where most of them landed for both HVAC and shell work. Um, the this key is, is you have to plan. Right here. This, this is Nate Adams numbers. There you go. Yeah. So house one through nine, um, you're seeing the range between 10,675 and your most expensive house, which is mostly this gray shell work. You're seeing that the electrification, which is related, you know, cause you do shell work mm -hmm. to reduce the HVAC load. But um, if you took out that gray, you'd see that most of them are in the range of 10 to 20 grand. Yeah. <laughs> yep. The, the curse work, being I mean, that about good. half of them need that in cold climates in yeah. our experience. But the, the good news is it seems like it might only be half. Um, so it, Sean, you were showing earlier the, uh, the 0.35 ACH natural, which is air changes per hour at natural, which is a metric that nobody really likes at the end of the day. Um, but that relates to if you get a blower door test, um, uh, say you have a 2000 square foot house and this will, there was somebody who asked about their 2000 square foot house. We, we do that size all the time. Um, you just, you change the furnace for a heat pump, but you have to do the math. Um, so it, if you just change one piece of equipment for another, it can work just fine. Um, 
uh, and she, I lost my train of thought. I was back to the 2000 square foot house. Uh, oh, the, sorry. So if you have a 2000 square foot house that has a 2000 blower door number, which is measured in cubic feet per minute at 50 pascals for uh, the US, if those are the same, that is about the 0.35 or 0.33 that Sean showed. And we're finding a substantial portion of houses are there. And that is often good enough that you can just electrify and it'll work okay. Uh, it may not be perfect. Their their annual cost may go up a few hundred dollars a year, uh, maybe five hundred dollars a year, but it shouldn't go up fifteen hundred dollars a year, which I have seen. Um, so, but the key to keeping the cost down is doing your planning up front, doing your thinking up front, understanding why you're doing the project and what it's worth, and then you design a project to that. And that's that's exactly what the HVAC 2.0 process does exactly. Now, here's an option for people to consider is going with duck list systems. So this is the heat pump stores pricing. They're big in Oregon, you know, in Portland, where you are, Joe, right? And um, up into Washington state. So for a single zone, 9,000 BTU, this is that the nine stands for 9,000 BTUs and this 12 is for 12,000, it's a one ton. This is their standard pricing. And I, for 10 years, had a 9,000 BTU heat pump heating my 1,200 square foot partially insulated house here in coastal California, in the cold part of coastal California. Um, so it gets you know, below freezing at night and such in the winter. And this is their pricing. It's just as a standard up to, this is two zones, meaning you have two fan coils, one in like the living room, one in the bedroom, three zones, four zones, five zones. But just to look at the prices that you'd see, $4,500 up to 12,000, 13. I love this slide, Sean, because, you know, I know here that, you know, Again, this is this is like a hack. It can be a, a, a really elegant solution if your home is is right, and you and maybe you've got several zones and blah blah. blah. But if not, it's a good hack for basically taking weaning you off your gas furnace because you can get a lot of comfort in the main part of your house for a really low price here and just use your gas furnace a lot less. But it's also possible with these mini splits if you've got the right house and you get the right system to get whole, whole home heating. And here where humidity is really not a problem, because I know Nate's got some concerns about mini splits in some areas, but here where humidity isn't really an issue, um, they were great. Uh, and you get air conditioning too, which a lot of people forget, you know, because we've been mostly talking about heat here, but uh, it's really nice, uh, you know, particularly here in the Northwest where people think you don't need air conditioning. Well, I think that's uh, proven to be not true. Uh, more and more every day. So yeah, Joe, do you think we should wrap up or do we, uh, I, I know we we're gone over here, but um, over. Yeah. this has do been want, great. This, is, this last little image for pricing, 50 gallon gas to electric heat pump water heater total project mm -hmm. cost, Sacramento. This is at 1600 installations here. And you can see this is the average line, which means it's costing between like 3,300 and 4,500 per heat pump water heater. But notice the standard deviations, one standard deviation down, you're seeing in the range of below three grand because they cost $1,200. Yeah. This is, is the where price. this is where that 120 volt water heater is gonna make a big difference because they're gonna cut these numbers almost, well, not maybe quite in half, but pretty close because you won't, most of that, wiring. a lot of that three to $4,000 is the electrician's visit and then the wiring and maybe even a panel upgrade. So yeah. It's uh, so. great. Hey, I wanna um, just do one little quick reminder for people here. Um, as I wanna say thank you to all of our presenters and remind people that there's tons of more information on this um, on our website as well, electrifiednow.net, including, you know, here in the Oregon area, trusted contractors where, you know, we touched on that a little bit, but we have people that we've worked with that we know are going to very familiar with these technologies and we can help you out and also give you a discount because a lot of them, you know, we, we help market their work. So they pass that discount on to you. So please um, check that out. We put the links to Sean's um, uh, materials. He's got tons of great uh, uh, answers for you there and, and Nate's course as well in HVAC 2.0. So check all that out. Thank you all for um, tuning in today. And thank you. I just, I'm so, this has been fantastic to have both you guys here on, on our show at the same time. I'm really pleased and thank you for the time. So, <laughs> thanks for having cool. us. Um, looking forward to getting emails from people, try to help you out with um, personalized answers.
Yeah, perfect. And we'll send the, the recording along with slides and other information. And we'll try to get other questions that we didn't get to answered by our panelists uh, in a, probably by tomorrow or possibly Friday. So thanks again for tuning in, everybody. And good luck on your electrification projects.